No, you got it. Whenever, whenever you're ready. Hello. So the only, yeah, I'm sure you have plenty of these. The only issue with that is uh, always awesome. Eight inches. Okay. Let us know if we're doing it wrong. Yep. Oh. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Hey. I'm Patrick Bowersock, Secretary of the Wake LP, and welcome to our speaking event this month. Uh, we'd like to welcome Mark Fleming and Betsy McCorkle from Clean Energy Conservatives. They're here to talk a little bit about clean energy issues in the state. And with for no further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark and Betsy. Thank you very much, Patrick. I will go first because Betsy has a lot more uh, good information than I do. So uh, you will get much better on, on the second than the first speaker. Uh, but I want to thank you all for having me tonight. This is one uh, event that I have looked forward to for some time. And I want to thank Patrick uh, for inviting me. I told Patrick earlier tonight, I wish I had his organizational skills. I, would, I could do great things. He was uh, you know, booked me to do this months ago and called and followed up. And uh, Patrick, I appreciate you taking taking time to do that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our organization and, and what we do. And uh, Betsy's going to talk a little bit. And then I think the, you know, the, the most uh, impactful thing tonight may be um, the question and answer time. And we want to be able to hear from you all. Um, and we appreciate uh, your engagement in, in policy issues. And we want to be able to, to hear sort of what's on your mind tonight. Um, I run a group called Conservatives for Clean Energy. We, found, we were founded in 2014, so we're four years old. And our job is to get conservatives involved and engaged in the energy conversation, uh, in the clean energy conversation, specifically as it relates to solar and wind and energy efficiency. And I'll tell you sort of how I came to this um, calls, if you will. Uh, I worked for a congressman in Western North Carolina, and it was uh, 2010, right after the big wave election of 2010. And I had an opportunity to represent my boss at a, a university, major university in, in our district, right outside of our district. And the topic was energy. And they had all of the new members of um, the state house and state senate, most all of them, or 100% of them in that particular meeting, conservatives. And they began with a 45 minute lecture on climate. And it was, you know, we know the climate's changing and who wouldn't believe in climate change. And, and, and they, then they took 15 minutes and talked about clean energy and the economy and what clean energy jobs meant to the state and free enterprise and competition. And, and they had the, the folks there, the conservative soon to be legislators, they were all uh, on board with that, but they, hurt themselves with 45 minutes of climate. And so I thought then that group has a wonderful issue set. Uh, they just don't know how to frame it. So years later, I had a chance to, 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 to uh, help um, serve as, as president and CEO of Conservatives for Clean Energy. And what we do is we try to get conservatives engaged in the conversation uh, in a productive way. And, and, and conservatives I've found those who are on the right of the spectrum, they want to be engaged, they want to be involved, they want to be for something. Um, and we do that through events. Uh, we do a statewide energy poll, and uh, something we've done now for four years, a poll surveying North Carolina voters. We did a 600-person um, uh, poll of North Carolina voters, and what the survey results say year after year is voters want more clean energy options and it is across the board. Um, it's, it's all parties, it's all genders, it's all races. It is um, one of the unifying issues in our society is strong support for clean energy. And so one of the things that we hear a lot about is, you know, why don't we have more options? And so one of our uh, poll questions in our poll is, do you think, uh, are you satisfied with, well, the first question we ask is, do we have a monopoly in North Carolina in electricity or can you 
you have choice. 86% told us that we had a monopoly. So the next question we ask is, um, do you want more options or are you satisfied with the current system? The numbers on that were 72% want more options, 17% satisfied with the current system. So, and that is across the board, it's across parties and you know, it is, it is a strong, anytime you're over 60% on a question like that, um, it just speaks to the fact that voters uh, want a change. And why don't we have a change? Well, we have a system that's a regulated monopoly system that, that most states, particularly in the Southeast, have. And that's the bigger conversation. Um, you know, it's not the fault of the incumbent utility here at all. It is just the system is designed, uh, the monopoly system we have is designed to, um, to, to, limit, to, to limit choice and competition. And so then on the, the issues we can do something about beyond that larger conversation about the utility business model, uh, we work on issues like data access for customers. Um, the utility knows when you're using power, they have that information in terms of time of day and what time those things are happening. As customers, we should have um, access to that data. We work on issues like third party energy sales. Uh, why shouldn't a company or a group of residents be able to contract with um, a, a third party company to sell and, and buy their energy. And, and those rooftop solar, you know, if you want solar on your roof, why shouldn't you have the right to do that? So those kind of issues are things that we work on. You know, in the 1970s and 1980s and, and years ago, folks working on these issues came at it from the left and they came at it from a mandate perspective and a subsidy perspective. But today, in today's world, with the falling cost of solar and wind, um, we are, the renewable technologies are equal uh, with a technology like natural gas. And, and we're now cheaper than, than technologies like coal. So, and that's not to bash any other technology, that's to say that the falling cost of wind and solar have, have had a huge impact on the conversation. And a lot of times we find um, opposition, folks are using data from years ago. Um, because, you know, solar and wind in particular uh, have seen drastic um, price declines and it continues to, to be the case. So that's just a little bit about what we do. I'm glad to be here and uh, appreciate you all coming out tonight. And I'll turn it over to Betsy McCorkle and to introduce herself and, and to uh, tell you a little bit about what she does. Betsy? Sit in the first seat. You want to sit in the first seat? Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Betsy McCorkle, and um, I'm a partner at, can you guys hear me? I can hear yeah, myself. A little bit closer. Okay. Um, I'm a partner at Kairos Government Affairs. Um, we're a lobbying firm here in downtown Raleigh, and about 50% of our practice is energy, and more specifically, it's clean energy. Uh, before my time at Kairos, I was um, Government Affairs Director for the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, and I took that job um, right as a um, Kind of the shift was happening in North Carolina, and Republicans um, had the majority in both the House and the Senate for the first time in 100 years. And we knew that if we were going to keep talking about energy and, and moving the energy conversation forward, we were going to we were going to talk to people who maybe had been convinced that clean energy was not the right path forward, either because it wasn't reliable or because it was too expensive. And we had a lot of data to tell us that that wasn't necessarily the case. But for so many years, the conversation had been about we need to clean up the environment. We need to stop climate change. And the only way to do that is if we have more solar and more wind. Um, but in North Carolina, that didn't need to be the conversation, right? North Carolina by itself is not going to stop climate change, whether or not you think it's happening or not. We're, we're not going to make that change. But what we can do is make ourselves more competitive so that we're driving more industry and more jobs in North Carolina. And we're seen as an innovative state, which I think we are in a lot of other spaces, uh, but maybe not so much energy at the time. And I think that is that has changed um, over the last six to eight years. And I think it's because um, legislators and regulators are more and more open to this idea of energy choice, uh, like Mark was talking about, um, as well as um, just the natural price decline we've seen because companies are demanding more and more of this technology. Um, we were talking earlier before the meeting started about Walmart. Um, I don't know a company that 
um, wants to control costs as much as Walmart, right? Because they, they need to sell at the prices they do, and so they have to keep their costs down. And yet, Walmart is on a trajectory to be 100% powered by renewables, and in most cases, that's solar. So that sh should tell most of us that that technology must have gotten pretty cheap. But what if Walmart was here today, and maybe maybe one of you worked for them, um, what I believe they would say if, if they were here tonight is, we need we actually need government to get out of our way now. We don't need the government to subsidize solar so that we can buy it. We need you to get out of the way um, so that we can have access to this technology without additional burdens. So part of what my firm does is we represent um, organizations like Mark's. We don't represent Mark directly, but organizations like her, his educational organizations that want to affect public policy as well as industry directly to make sure that we're continuing to move this ball forward and not um, not putting additional hurdles and burdens on companies that are trying to be innovative entrepreneurs here in the state. So I think what, what may be most interesting to talk about, we're happy to take questions, um, is this concept of, of just not having a free market uh, to work in when it comes to energy. We have choices on what kind of box, what kind of car we buy, what kind of cell phone we buy, what kind of TV we buy, um, what kind of internet we have. Um, but if we're, when it comes to what kind of electricity you have or where it comes from, uh, you have virtually no choice in the state. And we think that's problematic. Um, so we want to work with you. We want to work with anybody who's interested in kind of elevating that conversation so that we're not just kind of all beholden to you know, the next rate case where we're told what our energy prices are going to be next year, next month, um, where we can actually have a little bit of more control over that situation. I will leave it there as well, and we already have a question, so that's great. So I won't um, I won't speak to exactly how Walmart is setting up their contracts. Sorry, sorry. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Um, the the question was I think more from a technical perspective that if a store like Walmart wanted to be 100% powered by solar, how do you do that when Walmart's a 24 hour store and the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day? Is that Right. So the question is, how do you provide 100% renewables and still be an on-demand store? Um, so they're not there yet. I think one of the things that they are planning to, to marry with solar is storage technologies. And those technologies are coming online just as rapidly as I think solar has grown over the last eight years. Um, and to have access to banked power um, that was generated from the sun will help them get there much quicker. So, so the question was about decentralized solar, neighborhood level solar. Sorry. So, so what is what is your question about decentralized energy? Absolutely. So the question was, um, are any of the organizations we work for interested in kind of decentralized energy? And absolutely, yes. Um, has anybody heard of a microgrid? Okay, um, so that is absolutely something that neighborhoods are interested in. Okay, sure. So uh, um, the big grid is what we're all connected to, right? And that's how we get our power here, at home, everywhere. Um, but then we're also kind of beholden to what happens to the big grid, right? If there's a storm that comes in and knocks out power three blocks from here, we're all dealing with the consequences of that. Um, but if you're a, 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 I'll say a high need institution, you're a hospital, you're a school, you're a military base, um, you really don't have the option like maybe a restaurant does to be out of power for three hours. Um, and so what we're seeing is the development of microgrids where you can bring in kind of a smaller, more localized grid 
have more control over the power coming into that grid and leaving that grid so that when bad things happen, um, you, you have that localized control. And so there, there are policy sets that need to happen in order to make that available to industry directly without necessarily having to contract through a large monopoly institution. Um, so that's very attractive to some of our clients. Again, back to energy choice, it's not just about where the energy comes from, to your point. Who cares, right, if it's where it's, it's do we have access to it when we need it? Um, and if you're a hospital, um, that's of the utmost importance. Okay. Yes. So, uh, apologies to go back to Walmart, but how does a big MNC like that have selective choice for uh, something besides Duke Power? How are they going 100%? We're kind of individual, not being part of MSC or their families, get hemmed in the water. Like how, how are they legally? How are they doing that? So, uh, the question was how is a company like Walmart legally able to procure their, their energy from where they want? Um, in North Carolina, they're not allowed. Um, North Carolina just recently legalized something called third party leasing. Um, which the rules for that have not been developed by the commission, so it's not happening yet. Um, something that, that both of our organizations, many of my clients in your organization have advocated for is something called third-party sales. And, and one of the biggest champions of that is Walmart. Um, they're doing it in a lot of other states. And so they were actually very active in the North Carolina legislature to try to legalize third-party sales so they could do exactly what we are talking about. Um, they had to settle for something called third-party leasing, which may work out for them in the long run, but the, the kind of proof is in the pudding, and we're, just, we're not there yet. I think you just answered one of my, part of my question, but I'm a candidate for state senate in 16. So my first question is, quote, goal is what are the top five ways the state of North Carolina inhibits people from using it? That's what that was. Well, top one or two. What um, laws can I vote to repeal so that we can do this? No pressure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know it's as simple as like, hey, go find this law and repeal it. Uh, the question was, what are the top five, or he let me off the hook and said top one um, barriers in the current policy set that's keeping people from adopting clean energy. And um, in all fairness, uh, the legislature worked last year over the course of about 11 months to adopt something called House Bill 589. So um, I would encourage you to look at House Bill 589. Um, Clean energy advocates, industry, environmentalists, the utilities all got together and hashed out something that basically everybody could live with um, that I think solved some of the issues. And, and right now, all parts of 589 are being implemented through the Utilities Commission. So when I when I talk about the proof in the pudding for third party leasing, um, if the rules get adopted the right way, then we're good to go. If they don't, then one of my top things would be to go make sure that third party leasing is done in a way to give people access to the market. Um, but kind of bigger picture, 30,000 foot level, we are still operating in an environment where the utility, the incumbent utility controls everything. 589 created programs that allow you to work more collaboratively with the utility, but at the end of the day, it's their program, their rules, you're their customer, you still can't talk to another company about getting getting your energy. So that's I still that's that's still the number one. And that's because the energy company is a Duke or yes has a monopoly granted by the state of North Carolina. Yes, and the question what was, it will take to to repeal it. Doesn't the state constitution prohibit monopolies? It does. Okay, so uh, in other words, you guys doesn't. I don't know that they prohibit them. I think it. it I should have this language memorized. Um, something to the effect that it's not in the best interest of the citizenship. Right. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've read the case. Yeah, you, you, you put, somebody here can quote that to me better than I can quote it to you. I'm sure. The state of North Carolina grants monopoly. So, like Walmart can't do what Washington can do. State says no. And I've got one to add to that. Um, as part of House Bill 589, at the very last minute on the last night of session. A, an 18 month wind moratorium was added to that bill. Um, and it prohibits any wind energy farms in North Carolina. Uh, why that's important <laughs> is that in the northeastern part of our state, well, in the northeastern part of our state, 
um, the largest wind farm in the southeast was sited and, and is now um, running in an operation in Elizabeth City. The company that owns that wind farm is now the largest taxpayer in the counties that it straddles. It's somewhat in Pasquotank, some of it's in Pasquotank, some is in Perquimans. That company is now the largest taxpayer in those two counties. Uh, tremendous economic development uh, impact for a county, for two counties that need it uh, terribly. Well, there are two projects that are in the in the uh, queue, if you will, at least, there may be more, but there are two big ones uh, that would have a huge economic development impact on other counties around it. But currently in North Carolina, um, we are not allowed to move forward uh, with those wind farms. Now that legislation uh, sunsets at the end of this year, at the end of 2018. Uh, some wanted that to be a long, long term, like through 2021. But but our we have some good allies in our in the state house that fought to keep it at an 18 month moratorium rather than a four year moratorium. So one of the big legislative issues is to make sure. I mean, we'd like to um, the wind moratorium go away tomorrow if, if it was up to us. But um, worst case, to make sure that that wind moratorium is not extended. Uh, beyond December 31st, 2018. <laughs> Um, I, please, I'm not the, familiar enough the with offshore please wind. The question. Um, the question is offshore wind. Where are we in North Carolina with offshore wind? I know there are a couple of areas in North Carolina that have identified three areas in the state. Uh, one is tied into South Carolina, and then there are two north of that that have been identified as. Um, you know, acceptable for wind energy. And I know that um, the setback is like 25, 26 miles, um, which, you know, way out there. One of the, the one of the um, opponents or one of the opposition arguments, if you will, is tourism uh, in along our coast. And, and some of the tourist interests do not want to have visible windmills from the coast. But I think that the amount of miles they're talking about out there, it, it's not something you'll be able to see, but I, I think that's in the early stages and I am, I'm not sure of where that is, but that's coming. Offshore wind is coming. Um, there are states in the Northeast Rhode Island and other states that have uh, employed offshore wind technologies, um, but I, I don't know where that is in North Carolina. All right, a, a developer has the rights to develop it. Um, one of the three. I'm not quite sure how the taxing authority will work on that once it's complete. But what I, I think from a market, from a buyer perspective, what has happened traditionally with wind energy onshore is that the project doesn't get developed until there's a buyer. And so um, Mark was talking about the largest taxpayer in McQuimmons and Pasquale counties is at Amazon because they bought, they're buying the power. Um, and so when someone decides that they want to buy the power from one of these offshore farms, it will likely get developed. And then that buyer will, you know, be responsible for, you know, paying the taxes on it. But I'm, I am unclear on how that will be divvied up amongst the feds and the locals. And I, and I think there's been similar issues around offshore drilling, right? Like who gets the benefit of offshore drilling? Is it the local communities who are at risk of having an oil spill? Um, is it the federal government because it's federal land? Um, and I'm just not 100 percent sure about how that, how that will divvy up. So the question was about how do you um, how do you one of the defenses of the, the monopoly is that they, they maintain the the grid, they, they provide the power to people um, regardless of where they are in that jurisdiction. Um, and, and to be clear, um, I don't think Clark and I are standing up here saying get rid of the monopoly. We want it to be clear that there is a monopoly. 
Um, and so that if, unless it is going to go away, which some have tried without success, if it's going to be here, we have to be a little bit creative about how we spur uh, economic activity, entrepreneurship, and investment. Um, because there are states like Texas, for example, that is deregulated. Um, there are some utilities there that provide free power at certain hours of the day because you're getting it from wind energy, which is effectively free for them. Um, and so there's there are clear benefits when the market is allowed to, to do its job. There is also responsibility there too, right? So if you if you decide that you want to get your power from someone who has 80% wind in their portfolio, which would probably be a little high, um, you also want to check and make sure that utility is online 99.99% of the time. Um, or maybe you're okay with a utility that's only online 98% of the time if it means you're getting the exact mix of energy that you want. Um, so there are no guarantees, right? Even with, with the monopoly, there's no guarantees your power is going to be on all the time. But you don't get to make that decision on how reliable it is or what the what level of, of clean energy you're procuring. So um, it's a, there can be trade-offs uh, made in that situation. Um, but what we've seen in other states is that the freer the market, um, the more opportunities uh, we have for innovation. So the, the question was about rooftop solar, uh, the, the type of solar you might procure for your home or business. Um, I am not in the day-to-day -day, um, business of, of selling rooftop solar, so I might not have the latest stats. Uh, my understanding is that, yes, it is more expensive than wholesale solar, right? If you were to build a large solar facility, um, those facilities are on par um, with natural gas and, and what is called um, the avoided cost, which is kind of a, um, a wholesale rate. It is more expensive to have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight panels on your home. Um, it's um, just economies of scale. Um, and so I think depending on the size of your your house or your business, um, you may be looking at an eight to 10 year payback on a project like that, um, which it doesn't, that, so if it was wholesale, right, you can make your money back immediately. Um, <coughs> that's not the case with rooftop solar at the moment. Yes. yes. It, it, if I wouldn't encourage you to get solar if um, it's not going to pay pay you back, but it's an asset, and so there's some there's some thought here on a power bill as a liability. You got to pay your bill every month. Owning a solar system is going to add value to your home, and so. It, I, I try not to look at it as just how long does it take me to not have a power bill anymore um, because you have to figure in the fact that you have an asset it's just like a like a car or other things that you choose to own I mean when does a car pay you back um, I haven't had one pay me back um, yes. <laughs> The question is, how do you have a say in the legislative process on, on, on these energy issues? And I can tell you one of the things about working in energy policy that's a little bit frustrating is that uh, it is not on the top of radar for most folks, right? It is not taxes. It is not health care. It is not government spending. It's not even some process questions, right? It's, it's you know, what's the most important issue for you? The 2% would say energy. So it is very hard to get a legislator's attention uh, on energy issues by and large. However, what that also means is that a relative hand, relatively small handful of people 
can impact that policy. A legislator, whoever represents you, if, if 10, 15, 20 people from that district uh, call and say, we want to change on, or, or we don't want to win moratorium uh, ex extended. We think that's a crazy policy and we want to be able to see wind developed in North Carolina. 15 or 20 calls, a handful of calls from you and your neighbors gets that legislator's attention on energy policy. On other big issues, it's hard to move it with a, with a handful of folks. We can move energy policy with folks con because legislators then, you know, if they hear, especially from someone in their district, it's, it's one thing for Betsy or I to talk to legislators. It's another thing for them to hear uh, from people in their district. <laughs> So the, the question, I think if I heard it correctly, was that if you have solar panels on your home and you want to sell the energy to a neighbor, are you allowed to do that? The answer is no. Uh, it's very, very clear in the law uh, that you as a private citizen um, would, would be deemed a utility um, in that case, um, and then you would be regulated as a utility, and because utilities have chopped up jurisdiction in the state, um, you would you would likely be served a cease and desist, or I'm not an attorney, but uh, the, the utilities would have something to say about that very quickly. Yes. It's a good question. So the question was, what if you gave it to them? Um, and as far as we can tell, um, that's legal. Um, and and what we've, where we've seen that um, is in kind of apartment complex situations um, or housing, military housing, um, where the, the owner of the building pays for the, for the unit, for the solar, and then they may just be paying the electricity on behalf of the tenant, all of the electricity, not just the solar electricity. But you guys, you know, we've all lived somewhere where utilities were included. And um, that's, that's effectively your landlord giving you electricity. Now your rent may be higher, but there's not a line item that says solar energy. My neighbor has wind power. I have solar power. Give each other power. As far as I know, there is not a prohibition on giving power to someone else. Um, you would have, you know, would, would that, would you be obligating yourself to provide that person reliable service? I mean, once you start being terms of this gift, uh, then it starts to not look like a gift anymore. Um, and it is, it is important to distinguish that you can have as much renewables on your own property to be used on your property, you know, as you would like. So when we say access to clean energy, you have plenty of access if you want to kind of go off grid, so to speak, and procure these technologies and deploy them on your property. Um, as far as I know, there's there's nobody that would stop you from doing that. Yes. So the question was about uh, local government entities, uh, whether through zoning or through other practices, um, putting in hurdles or bans on renewable energy technologies. Uh, to be honest, that's been an issue. And there have been counties and cities that have said, either we have enough of this already, we already have four solar farms, we don't want another one, we want this piece of property be, to be preserved for a strip mall or a school or a recreational facility. Um, and some counties have the jurisdiction to make those decisions. Um, we've seen that throughout the state. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's, a, um, it's an overwhelming problem. Um, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. 
and um, sometimes it's ideology, right? Sometimes you have city council members or county commissioners that are just ideologically opposed to seeing these things developed in their communities. Um, but I think the rule, the the rule has been the majority of these cases have been um, we have these already um, and we don't necessarily want our whole county covered in solar um, kind of a, the anecdote we've heard a couple times <laughs> Do I have to repeat that question? <laughs> the highlights. That's fine. Um, the, the question was about individual homeowners, if a whole subdivision decided they wanted to use solar on their homes or solar shingles, any type of technology that's out there, they have now kind of created a, a resilient grid amongst themselves. Um, but there are local hurdles, I'm guessing maybe historic property issues and things at the city level. Um, yeah i i don't think there has been an effort um an effort that i've been involved in is specifically targeted um wanting to ensure that cities and counties um, can't put those hurdles on. I think, again, it kind of goes back to, for, for me in my work, um, the General Assembly is, um, you know, 170 members. They all come to, to Raleigh. It's kind of one set of government to focus on. Um, we don't see as much political activity on these issues in the individual municipalities. Um, there, there are examples where we've seen that, and we've seen counties, you know, reverse policies, um, but again, it comes from the voters in, in that case, more than organizations and lobbyists. Um, it's neighborhoods getting together and say, hey, we all vote for you in this neighborhood. Let us do what we'd like to do with our property. This is this is one of the, the funniest laws that I've worked with in North Carolina. There is a law on the books that says that a homeowners associate association cannot prevent you from putting solar on your roof, dot dot dot, unless it can be seen from a public right of way. Um, so, but what we've seen is that individual homeowners are working with a solar company. You know, there's five in this county alone that I know of. There's probably more. They've become the experts in working with homeowners associations to say, how do we, how do we make this work? And I don't have the statistics on this, but I, it, there's usually the homeowners association wants to work with the residents as long as the residents aren't proposing something that's going to bring down property values. So, um, but it, I might have somebody kick me for saying this, but it seems like that law might not be worth the paper that it's written on. Um, I'll probably hear from a solar company later saying, yeah, no, 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 we like that law, we like that law. It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The party in charge right now that claims to claim to support free markets is pretty clear that Duke Energy owns this power. It's not a monopoly. It's not, you know, it's not some mystery who this is. And in fact, Duke Energy has a huge influence. The question really is, 
can that be the big and any significant way for these for foreign good progress to be made? Because really the only problem is stopping all of this. People like yourself make this presentation, a very compelling argument. Everybody nods and yes, we break down the free market, tax is left and right, and all this great Walmart, and we can have these microgrids. The enemy is due, right? The, the company that is stopping all of these reforms is due. So why isn't that just the message driven on the vote? Do you want to follow up? <laughs> I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'll stipulate on this point. The question for you is how do you overthink? And part of the rationale for the novel in front of us is the example of the delivery of the product. It's hugely expensive. How do you what's your presentation? What's your rationale? It's to allow these to it's simple. You work up ATT, how do you put a phone call now? It's free. It's free. A phone call now is free. You slow it in and a phone call is free. I think it would come down. Yeah, I understand your point, sir, but I mean my question is, is do you huh? <laughs> Under pressure, they can change. I mean, they do. Monopolies do get broken up. Nobody took over your Congress to break up the So the, the tactical question to you: How do you stop this? How do you influence? How do you have an impact in breaking up the monopoly and changing the conversation to come up? The monopoly is what needs to be eliminated. I would argue that you're out. What's your presentation? Giving them a little Yes, being able to answer the I think everybody heard his question, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start there. Um, speaking to Duke Energy's influence. That has existed for a very long time, right? That's not a Republican thing. It's not that they have control over Republicans, control over Democrats, and they've been the incumbent utility for a very, very long time. We all turn on our lights every morning, thanks to them or someone like them. Um, they, they've done a good job. Um, I, I think that we haven't had, I said good job, right? They'll, they'll tell you that there's things that, that they can do better. We all know that. Um, I don't think we've seen, um, we haven't seen that kind of uh, defining moment that that rallies enough of us at one time to go to our elected officials and say, this has to change. I can no longer afford my energy. Or I don't want to bring my company to North Carolina because your coal ash cost cleanup is too high. I want choice of where my power comes from, and I don't want to pay for a utility's mismanagement of coal ash. Not my words, but maybe somebody's words who's trying to come into the state. Um, I don't think that that, that groundswell just hasn't happened. Um, I think largely the utility has been a reliable provider of energy at prices that are below the national average, um, that are below the average in the southeast. And so different things drive different people. I, I know that at the end of the day, cost probably drives me the most as passionate as I am about these issues. I'm not going to, I don't want my bill to go up 10 times so that I can say I have solar. I don't, I don't know many people that do. Um, so I think that it's, um, you're going to have to have a, you're going to have to have a defining moment to do what I think you're, what you're describing. Um, so the question about how do you, compensate for what a monopoly is obligated to provide. Um, I, I, I kind of think this question was asked earlier as far as, um, you know, what trade-offs are you are you willing to make? Um, the utility is regulated by the utilities commission. And so if the power went out for whatever reason and um, you didn't feel like your power was turned on in the right amount of time as a paying customer, you have a whole commission that is staffed by tons of people that you can go to as a private citizen and say, the utility is doing wrong by me, tell them to help me, and they will. Um, it's, it's a very good system. Um, 
if you were to move to a, a free market space, you would be subject to the same type of customer service that we're subject through everything else. AT&T, I had a fairly negative experience one time on the phone with customer service at AT&T, but it's a free market. And, and if, exactly. So if I have a negative experience with AT&T, I, I get to make that choice. And so trade off. You're, you're either free to make or you're not. And I will add, just speaking, you know, in general, I've done, we're doing work now in other states in the Southeast, and it's the same story, particularly in the Southeast, with the utilities. But I will tell you the influence is not what it was. Is the influence still strong? Absolutely it is. And so to stand here and say, well, utility doesn't have any influence. Well, of course they do. They have issue. they have strong influence in communities all across our state, but is it what it was 10 years ago? It is not. Um, and, and the other voices that are now in this debate, one of the things we're trying, our group is trying to do on this uh, rate case, um, Duke Energy Carolinas has a $13 billion, $13 billion with a B rate case. Um, a, a lot of it is, quote, grid modernization which is a lot in a lot of cases deferred maintenance like varying utility lines and, and other things and so we're calling attention to that and asking for a stakeholder process if you're going to ask ratepayers for 13 billion dollars let's get some folks around the table and see if if this is the right way to, to spend that money and those kind of um, conversations are happening now at least in north carolina and i would say in virginia uh, and other states in the southeast Again, the, the influence of the utilities is not absolute as it would have been 10, 15 years ago. The question was about EMPs and how are those being addressed or regulated or looked into in North Carolina um, in our monopoly regime. Um, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I've sat in in a couple of what I would call kind of informational committee me meetings where legislators have convened speakers to come in and talk about kind of the state of things. Uh, I'm not personally aware of policy um, that has addressed this. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but it's not something I'm familiar with. Okay. We're just finishing at this point. Yeah. Is there any more? We have. Is that a, I mean, I. 
I just got one, one more question. What, last question then. Is there any way we can get the uh, wind, wind band Y2 to the schedule somewhere? <laughs> but the question was can we get the wind uh band applied to the general assembly well, just the area around <laughs> just, to, just to close um again we, we appreciate you all taking time to be here and just to tell you in north carolina uh, we're making progress it is not the progress that that those of us who work in this space want to see but are we moving in the right direction yes uh, is there a long way to go? Yes. And I just encourage you all to um, to be involved in the energy conversation and, and speak out um, because I think this is an area where we can build some bipartisan support uh, and uh, libertarians and, and unaffiliated and Republicans and Democrats and Green Party. And I, I think this is one where uh, folks can unite and come up with some good policy solutions. So, again, thank you all very much for having us. So we got a couple of things here. Number one, I'm not nearly as prepared as Patrick and never am. So it didn't dawn on me with two speakers, I might need to give away coffee mugs because I'm not terribly bright. So, okay, you drink coffee, you're a big coffee fan. So, you know, when you're, you're doing your presentations, you're not happy with somebody just in the parking lot, when you see a Duke Energy uh, bumper sticker on a car, Place that over the bumper sticker, and you will have made your point. I guarantee you will have made your point. You may not be invited back, but you will have made a point. Um, so before I get to my last little bit, Brad, you had something you wanted to say to the group real quick about treasurer stuff, and then I'm going to talk about candidates and what we got going on. I, I hope I'm not going to steal too much of David's thunder. I, I just... Uh, first of all, thanks for coming, and uh, I did want to mention with respect to this presentation, if you learned something and you thought it was helpful, it has been uh, archived on our YouTube channel, so if there's somebody you know who would benefit from seeing what we saw tonight, uh, please, by all means, let them know that it's there. Um, I, I wanted to say uh, a big thank you to David and to Tim Samario. Those are the guys that have done the yeoman service in terms of the recruiting. Uh, as you all probably all know, re uh, the filing period ended this morning uh, at, at noon. I guess that's afternoon, technically. Um, and uh, I think the Libertarian Party was aiming nationally to get 2,000 candidates. And the uh, North Carolina portion of that, based on proportional, we have 10.15 million people out of the 323 million people in the United States, what is about 60 people, uh, and Wake County with 1 million people, our, our, our quota would have been about seven. And that's what we did last time in, in 2016. And I did most of that recruiting. I know how hard it is. Tim and uh, David did the recruiting this time, and we have recruited 15 candidates out of the 16 slots for uh, the Wake County, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly. In addition to that, we have a a candidate for county commissioner. I think that may be the first time in Wake County that's happened, um, and a couple more uh, for uh, U.S. Congress. Um, so that's great. We've exceeded our expectations. However, I am now uh, going to talk to you in my capacity as Wake County Treasurer. Uh, we have done well in terms of fundraising relative to what we've done in the past. Um, last year, we raised uh, seven thousand dollars. That's more than three times as much as we'd ever raised uh, in the past. However, on the scale of political contributions, uh, the Republicans raised $178,000. This is the Wake County Republican Party, and the Democrats $87,000. So we have a ways to go. In, obviously, we're not going to raise that much money. We have a smaller base. But we, we do have the opportunity this year to bring the message home in Wake County in a way that we've never had before. Um, so we have a uh, candidate accelerator program, which uh, funding for which is on our website. If anyone uh, can possibly see fit to help us out there, we're still $650 short of our goal, which uh, we were aiming to get by midnight tonight. We'll extend it a day. So if you have today or tomorrow, um, your money will really be very well spent. We've got a tr you know, more people as candidates than we expected. Uh, so uh, please, these guys are putting on in their time. Uh, let's help them to get the best possible exposure. 
uh, if you're interested in the details, there's information on the website about what we're doing with the money. Uh, we really could use the help. So thanks. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'll keep it real short. First, there's uh, quite a few people that are candidates in this room. Give yourself a round of applause. I appreciate it. A lot of y'all sat down, <laughs> talked to me, you agreed to run, you're going to carry the banner. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. I mean, very sincerely, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, this, this is just starting, though. Uh, for all the money conversation and all the you know influence and what have you, uh, we have people. Wake County is a purple county. If you don't understand what I mean, if you look at the northern and southern suburbs, that dial is a four or five percent dial. Don't sell yourself short. We matter. You know, guy, you're in a race that matters a whole lot. You know, there are races where our four or five percent activity will matter. So lobbyists who, you know, are talking to Democrats and Republicans and think maybe we don't matter. We may decide races in Wake County. In fact, I know we will decide races in Wake County. And the other team hasn't quite gotten the message. But they didn't get the memo. They're not seeing what's coming. But this is just, this was the start. This was putting the team together. This is, this freight train, they're not ready for it. They just have never seen it. It's never hit them. Their polling never includes us. They're not ready for us. They don't really know who we pull from or why. They're confused. We will have an impact. I guarantee you we will have an impact in November 2018. And I appreciate you all participating in the fight because it means a lot to me. Thank you.